This is the third lesson of our second module on similarity and triangles, extending our understanding and work of rigid transformations to any sort of transformation uh, and a sequence of transformations. A great quote, it's fine to work on any problem so long as it generates interesting mathematics along the way, even if you don't solve it at the end of the day. Andrew Wiles. In the first quadrant of your math journal, write down today's daily learning targets. 2.5, I can apply a sequence of transformations to one figure to get a similar figure. And 2.6, I can use angle measures and side lengths to determine whether two polygons are similar or not. A little activator here just to review ways to show equivalent expressions. What are some other ways to write this expression given? 10 times the quantity of 2 plus 3 minus 8 times 3. Using those properties that we've learned uh, last year, I provided four examples, one showing the commutative property, distributive property, inverse operations, and associative property. In the second quadrant of your math journal, write the problem, show your thinking, and indicate your answer. And we've discussed this in the past as we started investigating these different similar shapes. Uh, and so this is, in a way, as a warm-up, recalling some of that information and uh, writing it in a statement and identifying if that statement is true in all cases, some or none. And in this case, number one, if two figures are congruent, then they are similar, and that would be true in all cases. Number two, if two figures are similar, then they are congruent, and that is sometimes true, and specifically in only one case, when you multiply by a scale factor of one, whether it's negative or positive. And number three, if an angle is dilated with the center of dilation at its vertex, the angle measure may change. Well, we've identified in many of the activities in our last lesson that as we move further away or closer to that center of dilation, we're moving along rays that intersect those vertices. And so that keeps the angle measure conformed to that shape as it moves. In part A, triangle EGH and triangle LME are similar. Using the applet, find a sequence of translations, rotations, reflections, and dilations that show this. And so in class, we worked on uh, this first one together. And we went through each of these commands. So we have our line, we have our vector, in which I drew the vector from corresponding vertices from the pre-image to the image. That way, I was able to go ahead and translate by that vector and then use the new dilation from a point feature to scale it. Now, how do we find this, by the way? Well, we notice that we're starting with that larger shape, but it's getting smaller, which means our scale factor would be less than one. And so how did I find that? Well, we started at that center of dilation measured out to uh, another vertex. That is a distance of four units. And then we measured the new triangle. That's a measure of two units. So if we take two and divide by four, that gives us a scale factor of one half. And so I could put this in as one half or as 0.5. And there you can see H double prime, G double prime, E double prime. And the reason for that label is because we've moved it and, and transformed it twice. So we have our first transformation to H prime, G prime, E prime as a translation, and then a dilation with a scale factor less than one, specifically one half, from H prime, G prime, E prime to double H double prime, G double prime, E double prime. The second part I asked for you all to work together and do on your own and uh, touch base with me. But we discovered initially we might have thought that this was a rotation that was involved, but it's not. So we discovered that it's a reflection and a dilation. So see if you can do that without using the grid lines. Another activity we did right after that, part two, or act two, 
uh, was taking a figure like this one, an abstract of uh, our hand, which is an activity that we've done uh, in the first module, and doing or performing various sequences of transformations. And so we discovered that number one, uh, the figure is going to stay the same size, and so it's a rigid transformation or a sequence of rigid transformations using the translation and reflection. I showed an example of that and worked that out on my own grid paper for you all. For number two and number four, we saw the word dilation, which means that we changed the size of it, which means that those two are going to be a sequence of transformations, but not rigid transformations. And then finally, number three is another rigid transformation, a sequence of rotation and reflection that will map that figure A to a new figure that you create, figure D. To synthesize, assuming that the rotations are not through an angle that is a multiple of 360 degrees and that the translations of a non-zero horizontal or vertical part, dilations will create larger or smaller copies depending on the scale factor as seen in previous lessons. Translations will slide the figure in some direction. Rotations will tilt or turn. And reflections will change the handedness or the, the backwardness, in a sense, of the image to a resulting image that looks to be mirrored, whether it's vertically uh, or horizontally or uh, after a rotation of some sort uh, at an angle. <clears throat> I chose to show all of these uh, main ideas to kind of synthesize everything we've learned before to help you navigate through these four sketches. A team talk activity that we next pursued was looking at these two larger rectangles, uh, A, B, G, uh, H, G, and A prime, B prime, H prime, G prime, and noticing that there is uh, two shaded uh, sets of rectangles. There's the blue rectangle on the left uh, that's transformed and translated over to the second image that has a different set in yellow or orange uh, shaded rectangles. And the question is, are those two equivalent? Meaning, is the rectangle shaded in blue having the same area as the shaded regions of both the two smaller rectangles shaded yellow or orange, depending on your screen? The answer is, that yes, they are equivalent. The question is, how do you get to that answer? So it kind of ties into that quote from the beginning of the uh, presentation that it's more important to study and investigate how to get to that answer, right? How to get to that solution. Because at times, especially in the real world, we're looking for innovative solutions that will change over time based on new technologies and new tools and uh, new ideas that develop from those uh, initial solutions or processes. So taking notes in your math journal using colors and tools to make the process meaningful for you, write these key concepts. Similar figures have congruent corresponding angles and proportional corresponding side lengths. For some figures like rectangles or squares, it is sufficient to focus on side lengths since those corresponding angles are automatically congruent. Remember that squares and rectangles will always have 90 degrees. But then for figures like rhombuses, where we know that the sides will always be equal, it is sufficient just to focus on the angles because that's what's, that, that is what might change. And we want to compare those from the pre-image to the image to see if they are uh, similar or congruent. Digging deeper, on the left is an equilateral triangle where dashed lines have been added, showing how you can partition an equilateral triangle into smaller, similar triangles, meaning it's made up of the exact same shape but smaller. So I showed you one version on the right side with that L shape using a scale factor that's half the size. And I challenged you to dig deeper and be able to fill in that shape with smaller L's that are one quarter the size. Pretty cool. The Pentagon. In part A, this diagram has several triangles that are similar to triangle D, J, I, which is right up here. There are three different scale factors that were used to make triangles similar to DJI. In the diagram, find at least one triangle of each size that is similar to DJI. So find all three of those. 
and then explain how you know each of these three triangles is similar to DJI. Part B, find a triangle that is not similar to DJI, and then I challenge you to go even a little bit further and find another triangle that was similar to that one that doesn't match DJI in similarity. Here are some uh, hints and tips that I shared with you that I've shaded in. And some of them may contain some answers. Some of them may help you start to explore some of those uh, triangles that are not similar in shape. All right, for your cool down, your closing, in the third quadrant of your math journal, let's write the problem, show your thinking, and clearly indicate your answer. In part A, Elena gives the following sequence of transformations to show that the two figures are similar by transforming A, B, C, D into E, F, G, A. Uh, e, F, G, D, rather. And the reason why D again is because we're sharing this point between both figures. So we discovered that this would be a reflection and a dilation with a scale factor of 2. Because if I start with this measurement of 1, and now that corresponding side over here is 2, then I multiply by 2, which is a scale factor uh, of 2, showing that it's going to get larger because it's greater than 1. Part B asked us to look at these two parallelograms, uh, which is going back to those key concepts that I shared with you, and examining and explaining how they are similar. And this is where we start getting into those proportional uh, or corresponding sides and comparing those ratios to see if they're proportionally equivalent or non-proportional so we can determine if they're similar or not. And when we discovered this, we saw that this is larger than this one. They all do have the same angles, so we would assume that it's similar. But remember, we did an earlier activity uh, in a previous lesson in which we just stretched it in one direction, uh, but it didn't actually scale the whole thing, right? So it kept one side the same length, but then the other side was longer. So in looking at these, I do notice that each of these sides are different lengths, but are the ratios equivalent, meaning are they proportional? So if I take 6 and compare that to the other long side of 4.5, should I be taking 6 divided by 4.5 as a ratio or 4.5 divided by 6 as a ratio? Well, remember, we're going from larger to smaller, which means it should be less than 1. Which one would produce a scale factor of less than 1? 4.5 divided by 6. In fact, I believe that was 0.75, and that is the same as 3 divided by 4, which is also 0.75. And so, in fact, these two, similar, uh, these two figures are similar. All right, so in the fourth quadrant of your math journal, reflect on your progress in mastering today's daily learning targets, rate your self-confidence, and explain why you gave yourself that score. I've added five more Khan Academy activities, so that's a total of 15 so far for your palette of problems. That includes some videos and some exercises. And then remember to make sure that you've completed today's four quadrants and notes in the event that uh, this is the lesson that I check uh, for your SMPs uh, for a formal formative grade. <clears throat> be here, be ready, be respectful, and you will be great at Griffin, and have a great day. Remember to be kind to one another.